I'd really like to thank Terry and the organizers for the opportunity to speak, and, and this is really a terrific and very timely session. And as you've already heard from uh, the speakers so far this morning, it's all about replication. So I'm just going to make a few remarks about uh, how that can work and, and choosing uh, studies in which to attempt replication. Uh, starting with uh, how to choose the studies for the original genome-wide association study. And we'd all agree, this is an epi meeting, that uh, a sine qua non would be to select a study with cases and controls as well matched as possible uh, with respect to a variety of confounders, but in the case of genetics, uh, ancestry is key uh, because we want to minimize this thing called population stratification or really just confounding by ancestry. And if we have cases who are drawn from a population that has a, a different set of uh, ancestries than controls, we're going to pick up uh, in our case control analysis a lot of alleles that are merely just different between the different uh, ancestral populations. And so one immediate strategy that has been by and large employed to date has been to restrict to a single self-identified uh, ethnic group. Um, the question is how good is that for uh, substructure in populations, uh, differences in ancestral background that can't be summarized by census-based definitions of race or ethnicity. And so there's been a lot of enthusiasm for statistical control of potential confounding by ethnic substructure using genomic control techniques. Uh, a very popular technique now is a uh, technique looking at essentially factor analysis of SNPs in the genome, be they ethnically informative SNPs that are known to be different between major ethnic groups or essentially random SNPs of these large SNP chips. And the question is how good are those techniques for reducing, perhaps even eliminating, ethnic differences between uh, outcome groups that we can't control for merely by restricting to a single self-identified group. Here's a little data from uh, Pete Craft using some data from a GWAS in the Nurses' Health Study, which I'll return to later. Um, but the intent here was to take a phenotype that we would strongly suspect there could be uh, potential confounding even within people of self-described European ancestry that could be confounding by substructure, and that phenotype is hair color, where there's essentially a known climb between North and South Europe, uh, more dark hair color in the South, more light hair color up to red hair color in the North. Um, and so this is a phenotype where as we analyze hair color, we would actually expect to pick up allele prevalence differences that differ between a generalization, differ between Southern and Northern European populations. Uh, and that's exactly what he finds. Um, so this is a uh, QQ plot looking at the distribution of expected p-values across 528,000 SNPs from the Illumina platform in about 2,400 women with self-reported hair color and a, a variety of other phenotypes. And here are the observed p-values. And if there was absolutely no difference between expected and observed, so there was no uh, difference, there were actually no causal alleles for hair color, plus there was no systematic population differences between or allele prevalence differences on the basis of population between uh, dark hair color and lighter hair color, the observed distribution would just line up on the diagonal axis. And in the crude analysis, there's a substantial departure with uh, a large excess of SNPs in this region here, p-values um, that are different between the observed and the expected. And the statistical parameter that's often used to summarize substructure is the lambda 1.24 in this case, which is substantial and just says that there's likely to be substantial differences between the allele prevalences in uh, dark versus light or red hair color. And we're only expecting, at the end of the day, uh, a limited number of truly causally associated SNPs that actually do control that phenotype. So the sus suspicion would be that a large number of these SNPs are due to uh, confounding by ethnicity, essentially. And then when Pete applies uh, Eigenstrat factor analysis, develops uh, four clusters, essentially, of alleles 
that uh, appear to cluster on the basis of uh, different ethnic groups and controls for them in the analysis, uh, the uh, lambda settles right down to 1.02, and there's far fewer SNPs essentially associated with this phenotype just on the basis of statistically controlling for the uh, clustering that is on the basis or, or presumed to be on the basis of different ethnic substructure. Interestingly, going from four to 50 such dummy variables in the regression uh, makes very little difference. So there's a limited number, or at least in, the, in these data, evidence for a limited number of population subgroups that if controlled for um, substantially accounts for the uh, potential confounding by ancestry uh, for this phenotype where we would expect such confounding. And so there's, there's now a large number of examples of this in the literature suggesting that these statistical techniques in populations that are, we, we make our best effort to uh, match for initially, these statistical techniques are actually pretty good. Um, examples of this in the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium which uh, Terry referred to earlier, and I really recommend uh, digging through the 40 or 50 pages of supplementary materials. They also discuss population stratification and show examples of uh, this in action in their studies. Um, but this meets no epidemiologist definition of great epidemiology. Um, seven control uh, case groups with up to about 2,000 cases, uh, rather eclectically sampled from different clinical and other populations, compared with two control groups, blood donor controls and uh, a birth cohort from the late 1950s. And yet, uh, at least at the first cut, they're able to, in their crude analysis, and, and they do a substantial amount of additional adjustment in their supplementary analyses, um, they have hits. Uh, as Debbie mentioned, no hits for hypertension, but hits for these other diseases, which in this initial paper they show replicate, and in a whole string of other papers that are coming out, uh, a number of these most strong hits replicate. So not to be pejorative in any sense, but you might call this quick and dirty epidemiology by our usual Society to Epidemiologic Research, uh, pristine standards, and yet the top hits at least are clearly robust if you at least take the first step of doing the study within a single country and uh, trying to restrict out uh, self-reported uh, ethnicities to limit, in this case, to populations of European ancestry. So broad matching on ancestry and region is probably adequate for discovery of the strongest hits. Statistical methods for control of population stratification, at least uh, with the demonstrations so far within populations of European ancestry, are adequate to assist and weed out some of the uh, initial hits that are merely b based on uh, confounding by ethnicity. And the big question is, would more rigorous, uh, better technique in study design permit the discovery or be necessary for the discovery of weaker associations? And I think that's, that's really uh, a live question and something that we're going to discover over the next few years and could usefully be the substrate for some uh, simulations and methodologic analysis. Because the real issue here is when the signal to law is is low, you, we're looking at, at much weaker hits than these initial hits, um, there's a huge potential for false positives, noise due to multiple comparisons, and how does that compare with the noise due to poor matching of controls, essentially? And uh, we can deal with the false positives with enough replication, as, as I'll discuss, but the real issue is if we did uh, poor design GWAS and then we go on to replicate subsets of those SNPs, um, are we uh, missing hits initially, false negatives, that we then fail to attempt to replicate. And uh, I think everybody would agree that we should always do the initial GWAS in the best designed population available for that particular phenotype. Um, but for many phenotypes, we have to admit that we actually don't have substantial uh, best quality uh, epidemiologic studies, and so we're forced to use these more convenience approaches of clinical cases with uh, common controls. Now, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but it's already been referred to. Steve Chanick and Terry and others uh, put together a very nice review of replication, which sort of makes my job here uh, unnecessary if you just read the review that came out in uh, Nature a couple of weeks ago, um, just pointing out that we have to be very careful about language when we talk about replication, that uh, if we are talking about replicating uh, 
uh, initial studies, we should be very careful to be replicating the same association, not uh, a different phenotype, the same genotype, not the same gene with a different SNP that may not be an LD, et cetera. And so they uh, make some very nice recommendations for how to organize this and to present it, to think about it in prospects, but also to analyze, uh, present, and even review and edit the data to try and minimize the amount of noise we introduced at the replication stage by people essentially uh, overreaching to say that because uh, a SNP that uh, is in the same gene as a previous association replicates, but that SNP might be in no LD with a previous association. That's clearly a very different form of replication, if, if it's replication at all, than replicating the same SNP for the same phenotype. A few uh, considerations about uh, how to approach the initial GWAS. Uh, there's clearly a wide variety of technical issues that other speakers are going to talk about. The standard advice we think about for any biomarker, handle the case and control samples exactly the same way at every stage would be the best practice, uh, not always achievable. Uh, John Todd has a very nice paper in Nature Genetics last year showing that DNAs from cases extracted uh, by exactly the same uh, extraction, DNA extraction method, than DNA from controls, um, but the method was operationalized by two different labs, resulted in DNAs that gave rise to uh, different genotyping characteristics, different signals in the genotyping platform, um, because, just merely because the DNA was extracted in different laboratories but using the same method. So ideally, we'd always be handling case and control study specimens exactly the same way. And we're going to be substantially limited uh, in epidemiologic studies by uh, whose study has actually collected DNA. Um, and uh, the, the sort of bottom line is that blood and buffy coat seems to yield uh, very good quality DNA in most people's hands. Um, initial studies for the large number of studies that have now collected buccal cells using a variety of protocols. Some of the initial data is encouraging. So Heather Fagelson has a paper in CVP recently uh, looking at the swish and spit uh, alcohol scope protocol and got very good large scale genotyping completion rates and concordance rates uh, with buffy coat samples from the same people. But anybody who's worked with buccal cells knows that there's a wide variety of quality and, and probably the majority of these samples are not going to be easily sustaining very large scale analyses, uh, particularly the older samples that were collected under other protocols longer ago. Whole genome amplified DNA right now uh, AFI will accept that, and it will run. Illumina's not quite there yet, but they claim it's in development. So again, this has major implications for studies that just have a very tiny amount of DNA and don't have the one or two micrograms that uh, you'd really need to have to apply one of these SNP chips with the current technology. What do we mean by replication? So for statistical replication, uh, again, the recommendations from the group in Nature uh, point out that you'd like to essentially be attempting initially to replicate in studies that are very, very similar to the initial studies. So similar definition of phenotype, similar ancestry. But as one of the questioners uh, asked for generalizability, obviously we'd like to know how replicable these findings are across populations with different ancestries. And here, different ancestral backgrounds, as Debbie Nixon referred to, might actually help us narrow the interval of linkage disequilibrium and might actually help us move from linkage to causal association. So there's definitely a role for essentially cookie cutter, very similar studies, but also reaching out to studies, uh, particularly those involving studies with uh, people of different ancestries. Study design, uh, again, we'd almost always like, if we could get it, to get perspective data. Um, rather than case control data, particularly for diseases that have fairly rapid fatality because that will protect us against survivor bias. Um, in theory, if you have a uh, blood resource and you have informed consent and you have samples from everybody, then you've got essentially 100 percent participation of both cases and controls, and that should protect from selection bias. Um, prospective studies also, we, we think that the environmental data is not going to be susceptible to recall bias in the way that they could be for retrospective studies, and so that will aid in the interpretability of gene environment analyses. 
And there's always the chance that if you're doing a prospective study and there's plasma or serum measurements, that uh, those biomarkers will be simultaneously available uh, to the GWAS. Um, study quality is a tricky issue. And you know here, we've spent a lot of time in epidemiologic meetings really trying to sort of define what we mean by study quality. Uh, when we apply it to at least to these initial phase GWAS, the, the slightly sobering thing is, as somebody who was really brought up with best practices of epidemiology um, and thinking about methods a lot, uh, today it, it, it's not apparent that there's really a strong relation between what we would usually use as measures of quality and the probability of replication in studies. And I'll show an example of that. Uh, but it may, may be because we're just looking for the strongest signals, and so that's robust to uh, some uh, selection bias or limited participation in studies. And it may matter more for weak signals. Um, but again, the initial information really suggests that sample size might even trump quality as long as we're with some reasonable limits and, and we're not uh, throwing our standard methods right out the window. Uh, and as long as we have some attempt to match on region and ancestry, uh, sample size is important because we're dealing with uh, much weaker signals than we thought we might be dealing with when this really got going a few years ago. So here's an example from the NCI Breast and Prostate Cancer Cohort Consortium, uh, almost 8,000 cases of prostate cancer. And this is a SNP in one of the regions Debbie referred to where there's no gene in sight, AQ24, um, initially identified by the DECODE group and the multi-ethnic cohort. And here's a pooled result across 8,000 cases relative risk of about 1.3 for the heterozygotes, 1.8 or so for the homozygotes, 10 to the minus 19 for the test of trend. Um, but that was obtained by pooling data across uh, seven nested case control studies, what we usually think of as kind of best practice quality. And uh, for most of these individual studies, the, certainly the rare uh, homozygote or the less common homozygote relative risk is not significant. Some of the tests for trend are uh, significant, some of them are not. If we only looked at the EPIC cohort, for instance, uh, as a large scale, high quality replication with about uh, 900 cases, um, that test for trend isn't even significant, and we would have called that failure to replicate. So again, the message that's been uh, said earlier, we need large numbers, and we need to pull across multiple studies uh, to pick up these relatively weak effects. And very quickly, here's another example from the Eastern et al. Nature paper looking at five SNPs that came through their three-stage design uh, in breast cancer. And uh, here's the strongest SNP, a SNP in uh, FGFR2. Their initial association uh, in the stage one, which had to be strong to be picked off for uh, screening in stage two, where they screened about 13,000 SNPs out of the initial 240,000 SNPs that they looked at. Um, Here's the winner's curse in action. Uh, basically, we know when we screen for the top p-values that we're going to be biased in favor of picking up the associations that just happen to be strongest in that first stage. And that suggests that uh, a lot of the initial screens need to be uh, looked at more carefully because there'll be things that didn't pass the threshold for confirmation that are probably truly associated but just weren't that strong in the initial data. Um, and then a large stage three with 20,000 cases across almost 20 studies. And the quick bottom line here is, at least for this SNP, uh, very, very strong, robust 10 to the minus 70 ultimate confirmation of an effect that is about 1.3 per allele, so 1.3, 1.6 for homozygotes. Um, but in the phase three, it's interesting that uh, no names mentioned here, but this is really a mix of studies that epidemiologists would consider as best practice, like the nested case control studies in this list, and other studies that uh, you know, were almost in the convenience category class, uh, a series of cases with a uh, hospital-based controls or other control information. And there was really little, uh, for at least the strongest hit, relation between what we'd identify as best quality and what we'd identify as least good quality. Um, so at least for the strongest hits, it seems to be sort of fairly robust to quality, perhaps because, as Wendy pointed out, there's often not likely to be a very strong relationship between probability of participation and genotype. Um, once you get into the weeds a little bit for these less strongly associated SNPs, it's an open question. Um, but I think sample size is really the dominant factor here. <laughs> 
So uh, how are we going to really uh, deal with the problem of replication? I just want to point out that, um, uh, as has already been described, posting these data early and often are going to be key. Here's a resource from the NCI CGEMS project um, where you have been able to obtain since uh, October of last year and April of this year the Illumina platform for large-scale analyses of prostate cancer and breast cancer. And so essentially, you can get instant repl replication. Uh, you don't actually even have to have an initial genotyping project. You can just have an idea for a gene, and you can basically dial it up in this database and immediately get the p-value ranking, the p-value from uh, a large-scale uh, nested case control study of prostate, a different one of breast, and uh, that is all essentially available and open access, no registration, uh, no problems. So basically, instant replication is increasingly becoming state-of-the-art, and there's going to be a large number of resources. Uh, dbGaP has already been mentioned. Dan Levy is going to talk about framing and welcome trust, uh, tell you that you can get access to their data with a registration application procedure. The Diabetes Genetics Initiative have had data up for about three months now on a variety of biochemical phenotypes. And so if you have a hypothesis for some phenotypes, you can already go and test that hypothesis in silico. Just very quickly to run through how this worked in the CGEMS project for the same gene, FGFR2. Um, initial hit, uh, here are the six top SNP hits for breast cancer in the Nurses Health Study in the CGEMS project. And the main point here is that there were these two SNPs, two, two top SNPs out of the top six extreme p-values um, that, that did replicate, but six of them did not, including a gene when I saw it, TLR1, TLR6. This, this has been associated with prostate cancer. A number of studies seemed like a home run here for breast cancer, uh, zero evidence of replication. Um, so again, replication is key, and just looking at the name of the gene on the initial list will take us down a lot of blind assays, alleys. Uh, as well as blind assays, I guess. Four SNPs on the initial chip, and here are three studies replicating the initial association with about the same strength of signal. Um, but again, one of these studies actually wasn't uh, significant, two of them were, so we need to put together uh, as many studies as we can to get pooled analyses. And even here, there's a substantial unfinished agenda because these are essentially linkage analyses. We have to find the causal variant, and then that Presumably, we will tell us about mechanisms of carcinogenesis. So uh, to finish, um, the hits keep coming. And uh, the season's still got a long way to run. And there's this very, very substantial unfinished epidemiologic and public health agenda, which I think we can all contribute to, whether or not you're in the GWAS or even genetic epidemiology business at all, that these studies will contribute to. Um, Gene-environment interaction, obviously, what will knowledge of the main effect of these genes uh, help tell us about new hypotheses for environmental risk factors, et cetera. Gene-gene interaction, a lot of interest in trying to summarize all of this in pathway analysis, uh, a huge area. What, is, what are the clinical implications for risk stratification of the screening, for instance? Uh, how are we going to manage the science of if we agree that there are some of these SNPs that's worth screening for, what are the interventions that could be proposed, what level of evidence are you going to want to see before uh, really knowing you can safely recommend those interventions or not, what are the health policy implications of increasingly being able to identify uh, high-risk and low-risk strata for a wide variety of phenotypes across the population. And the good news is that most of the data for these analyses is going to be either publicly available or are relatively cheap. That once the GUS are done, once the multi-stage designs are done, once the GUS are put together, then we're back to essentially single-plex genotyping or very low throughput genotyping for the hits that come through that are validated. And that, again, is much, much closer to everybody's budget if you have the samples than these initial very expensive large-scale analyses. Just like to thank um, all the team at the Harvard cohorts, particularly Peter Kraft, for some of those analyses. Um, the BPC3 investigators, again, these are examples of the large-scale multi-center uh, collaboration, collaboration direction that we've been talking about, and also the uh, CGEMS team at NCI, ACS, and uh, Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you very much.